next speaker is Drew Endy. Uh, he's a faculty of bioengineering at Stanford and president of the BioBricks Foundation. He's a member of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity and the Committee on Science, Technology, and Law. He's also a co-founder of Gen9 Incorporated, a DNA construction company, and the iGen competition at Genetic Engineering Olympics, now engaging 4,000 students annually. So please welcome Andrew. back to Earth. If you're already in love with biology, I hope to add more reasons. And if biology is new to you, I hope to uh, leave you excited to engage in biology. What you see here is uh, something we might take for granted. It's a collection of systems that are capable of flourishing in our environment. They're capable of taking atoms from the environment in the environmental context and assembling them into really incredibly improbable, beautiful systems. And normally you don't think about life that way typically, but there it is. You have these natural nanotechnologies that are capable of reproducing themselves. It's not a gray goo that's taken over the earth. It's a green goo, and we're part of it. So life is now on earth. Uh, the reason I'm particularly excited to be here at this event is to combine our understanding of biology as a science, our capacity to think about biology as a technology, with a set of questions related to what we wish for and why it's important to re-engage in our wishes of what we would like to see of life. Looking back in time, we humans have interacted with life and resulted in the design of life, whether we like it or not. And so shown here are three natural plants. Uh, you're familiar with each of these, but perhaps not in the form shown. So that's a carrot, as it was found in nature. That's a watermelon. That's an eggplant bananas, broccoli, and corn. Right. Over a period of time, through choosing mutants that have different traits, we find these plants in their modern form, natural, organic, what have you, but shaped over thousands of years by human practice. We really enjoy the ability to take the gene pool and use it like paints. It's, it's our art. This is my art. I made this beautiful dog that I enjoy. I made her. I chose her sire and her dam. I chose several generations to make this beautiful dog. I'm very proud of her. As soon as you can choose, you can decide what you want. You can select and breed. We do this not just for plants, but animals. We do this also by shaping environments. If we destroy the forest and replant that with oil palms, right? you shape the environments in which other living systems flourish or not. So whether we like it or not, we design biology from the outside in. Starting at Stanford in San Francisco a human generation ago, we now also shape biology from the inside out by designing the molecules of DNA and seeing what that can lead to. This is the patent from 1980 demonstrating a method for making chimeric DNA molecules. Okay, so uh, a nice painting from the Gardner Museum in Boston. I used this uh, as backdrop for three questions. Is now the right time to think about designing biology anew? If so, what do we want? And if we want something in particular, do we have a plan? I also used this painting to remind myself to share a recent lesson for me having to do with when answering questions of these types. Uh, it's not that there's one correct answer, but there is a plurality of possibilities we might want to support and sustain debate around. This is what I'm going to try and get through. So um, here are uh, some outcomes of genetic engineering over my lifetime. Not that I was involved with this, but as I grew up, this is what was happening in California. Once genetic engineering was invented, Genentech making recombinant insulin for treating diabetes, Amgen making erythropoietin for treating uh, anemia or cheating in the Tour de France, uh, Amaris making artemisinin for treating malaria. Now highlighted in the peach color overlay is the tool used for designing the DNA. And it's really cool, right? They're using BAMH1, a restriction in the nucleus, a little molecular scissor that cuts DNA in a specific sequence so that you can make a chimeric molecule, cutting and pasting reaction. That was state of the art in 1979. And look, six years later, Amgen, how they make their stuff for cloning the EcoG. Well, we're going to convert this site into a BAMH1 site. Right? And how about the methods that Amherst used? Well, they're using different molecular scissors, speed one and N3, 
that cut at different sequences on the DNA, but it's the same fundamental tool. And I focus your attention on tools for two reasons. First, when you think about designing and making creative works, it matters what your tools are. What can you actually shape and realize? Not just what you can imagine, but what you can actually make. The second is, over this period of 26 years, the fundamental tools that support the genetic engineering workflow are practically unchanged. Right? Now let's contrast that with something we're more familiar with, perhaps. This is a workflow in the 1970s around making semiconductor uh, microprocessor-like objects. Um, and here's what it looks like about the same period of time later, where you have not humans manually cutting the masks used in the lithography process, the entire industries that have computer and design tools, software that supports the flow of information into the fab process. So over this period of time, for the electrical engineers, the workflow wasn't static, it was massively dynamic. The tools used to engineer the electrical systems upgraded year after year after year. And this has been quantified, uh, again, over my uh, lifespan, in, in part uh, through Moore's Law of transistor count per chip, um, and it's growing uh, geometrically over time. The ramifications of this is things can change. What you can design can change. The history of Pixar is really terrific. There's a great interview with one of the co-founders in Wired where they relate how they actually set out to make animated movies two times before they got to Toy Story. But they learned that the cost of rendering the animations were too expensive until you eventually had to figure out when the right time was on Moore's Law to go with Toy Story. So could we take some lessons from engineering, if you will, or anywhere, and see if we could re-engage with biology as a type of material for design and making? And we started asking these types of meta questions back around 2000. One early work product from these explorations was a report commissioned by the Advanced Research Projects Agency. And this is the three, first three pages of that report that I briefed the director of the agency, the director of DARPA, back in 2003. Now let me try and summarize what we said. We said that um, regardless of what you're engineering, there's a design build test cycle at the core. And as soon as you have an idea, you want to design something, build it, see what happens, and then learn from that and just keep moving around. If you wanted to sustain exponential improvements in our capacity to engineer living matter, we'd have to figure out how to upgrade this cycle. And most importantly, sustain improvements to this cycle. And so we said three things very specifically. You can go back and read this report in 2003 said, let's separate design from construction. Well, somebody can be an architect of DNA, and somebody else can be an expert builder, a general contractor. We're going to use this tool called DNA synthesis to do that. Um, let's develop standards to support coordination of labor, reuse of materials. And let's borrow from computer science a concept not shown on this slide that I call abstraction for managing complexity. I'll give you a quick tour of each of these. So here are bottles of chemicals. These chemicals are derived from sugar. And uh, there are four bottles, so you can guess there are going to be four bases of DNA, A, T, C, G, one in each bottle. Bottles cost about 250 bucks each. I hook these bottles up to a machine. This is a 15-year-old photograph, so they're not state of the art. This machine is called a DNA synthesizer. So if you're familiar with the musical synthesizer where you have a keyboard and sound comes out of a speaker, this machine is going to have four keys, the A, T, C, and G key. And depending on the ordering of how you press those keys, you'll get a particular sequence of DNA printed from scratch by this machine. And that piece of DNA is not alive, it's just a tape, right, a polymer of nucleic acid. And depending on what you do with it, you can put it in a cell so that something happens, or you put it on the shelf and store the information there. Um, I'm in love with this technology, in part, uh, because it allows you to go from abstract information, i.e. our intentions, our wishes, into physical material instantiating possible biological designs. Okay, so you've heard of Moore's Law for computing. Uh, this is the equivalent for reading and writing of DNA. And in the blue curve here is the cost of reading DNA or sequencing DNA. How many, how many bases per dollar can you read out? If you give me a piece of DNA, how much will it cost me to tell you what the ordering of the letters are? And the cost down there was, and again, this is a logarithmic curve, the cost down there was pretty terrific, and then it's super accelerated here. Just to give you a little context, the first microbial genome was read in 1995. Uh, by 2001, we had the draft of the human genome. It's not because the geneticists got a billion times smarter during the Clinton administration. It's because the tool for reading DNA got a lot better during that same period of time. It's also 
as it's gotten better and better and better, becoming much more affordable. So if you're a pregnant woman, you can now get access to the sequence of your unborn child by pulling a blood sample and having the DNA circulating in your blood sequence, which includes the blood, the DNA of the fetus. Huh. All right, now, writing. Uh, writing is in these colors, uh, not as uh, uh, sharp an improvement as, as uh, sequencing, but improving reasonably well. So for example, when I first started teaching, as you'll see in a minute, it cost $4 a letter to print my students' designs. Today, it's about four cents a letter. So um, in the Intro to BioE course, this is a homework assignment from Stanford. We're going to give you 60 bases of DNA to encode arbitrary messages, whatever you want. One student, she says, I'd like to encode the Stanford logo with a little S and a tree and a bitmap, right? And I can make this little key code. I can then you know, write that out in binary digits, but I can then map those binary digits into bases where double zero equals A, zero one equals T, and so on. So if I order this all out, please make this piece of DNA from scratch for me. And now I'll have a little molecule that encodes the Stanford logo. All right, so that's a typical homework assignment from last spring. It costs us about five bucks to print the molecule on the synthesizer and so on. My first PhD student is now a professor in biochemistry at UCLA. He has more money, and the tools keep getting better. And so what he's doing. <laughs> taking the most recent album from OK Go and encoding the entire data stream of that album into synthetic DNA. Right? So think about changes in technology, right? how you surf uh, exponential divorce law effects, the rewrite of DNA. Here's a different way of thinking about this. The last time I was in this room was when we proctored the exam, the final exam for Introduction to Bioengineering at Stanford uh, in uh, June of this year. Okay? And this is the first question from the exam. So you're now all BioE students at Stanford. Uh, you get two points on the final if you put your name down. Uh, over the past 12 years, the price of building DNA has dropped from four bucks a base to four cents a base. Let's pretend that will continue. Meanwhile, Stanford's tuition is not on the same favorable trend. It's actually going up in cost. And it looks like our tuition doubles every 15 years. And we're now at 50 kilobucks a year. So you have one logarithmic curve dropping twofold every two years. You have another one growing twofold every 15 years. At what point in the future will the cost of printing a human genome from scratch equal the cost of attending Stanford for a year? We want to see if our engineering students can do some simple math. Now remember the purchase order for when we have to rebuild Martian life. It was placed in 2035, and we had to return the product by 2040. A very generous five-year window. It turns out the answer to 1A is 21 years from today, 2036, one year after your purchase order. So if we can continue 2x cost down every other year, 21 years from today, the cost of printing a human genome will equal the cost of attending Stanford for a year. That's ridiculous. <laughs> now we grade 1A on the math. 1B, we grade on, is it a reason to answer? We're not valuing the answer. Presume you're going to have a kid someday with your partner as potential parents. Are you going to save up for Stanford tuition? Or are you going to save up to build their genome from scratch? That split the class. <laughs> All right. Now, that, was just the, that was just the first thing we recommended back in 2003. Separate design and fat. Here's uh, standardization and abstraction in one slide. Let's say I'd like to put that object up on the top, an 8-bit counter that can count to 2 to the 8th or 256. You know, like every time somebody comes into the room, I'll count the person coming in so I know if we're over the fire marshal safety capacity. Now, counters, in other words, are super useful, but what if I can put a counter, see, I'm never going to put that thumb press mechanical counter in every cell of my liver. It just won't fit. So, so how can I put a counter that could do something like count cell division events? You know, or count how things are developing, how many times you know, some weird chemical has tried to take out something. Right? I'd like to keep track of data in places where the electrical and mechanical systems don't work. So I want to do that by flipping DNA back and forth and yada, yada, yada. That's just, oh, how do I even think about engineering and DNA doing that? In other words, what letter do I start with writing the DNA program that makes a cell division cycle counter that counts to 256 cell divisions? Do I start with an A, a T, a, a C, or a G? And, and it's a crazy hard question. It would be as if you know my mom's visiting us in Menlo Park, and I want to send her a text to let her know how the schedule's going. 
and I have to figure out, do I send that text message by entering a zero first or a one first? And then once I figure out the first bit, what's the next one? Right? You don't do that because it's impossible to keep track of all of that. Instead, you create this artificial hierarchy of function where you go from the high level thing and say, you know, if only I had off the shelf somewhere things that flipped one at a time. If I had a, a rack of those, I'd take them and start to reuse them. And if only I could organize the enzymes that recognize and flip DNA into objects that I could more readily reuse, and eventually I'll ask somebody to make the DNA. But the person up here who's actually working at this high level shouldn't have to know that DNA is made up of four bases or anything about how to synthesize the molecule. I mean, just way too much to know. So this is in a, in a very high level, quick intro, uh, shouldn't be satisfying, but enough to get wet your appetite to this concept of abstraction that we've been working on now and seeing work out to a degree in, in synthetic biology. As a result, you know, you can do things like what this fellow was observing uh, back in Ireland in the 1850s, where you look at how we interact with the world, whatever the world is, Mars or Earth or you name it, we tend to use language to describe what we observe and then reflect our intentions. And George Poole, you know, notice that we tend to reuse words over and over again, such as and and or, right? You know, like if it's warm outside and it's not raining, then I won't wear socks, right? See how that word and was in that sentence? It was kind of useful. If it's snowing or it's raining, I'll put a hoodie on, right? You know, so these, these words are incredibly useful. So useful are these words that we re-implement their equivalent function in every material we can engineer. Mechanical, hydraulic, electrical, it's called logic. Um, I happen to be working as an engineer at a point in time where I'm going to implement this logic, these logical functions inside the DNA of cells to realize stuff that uh, I might want to do inside living matter. Uh, is my immune system reacting strangely inside my gut and do I have fructose then do something? Okay, so is now the right time to design biology? I'm just going to say yes. And the reason I'm saying yes is for the first time in the history of genetic engineering we've had a decade-long investment and importantly a community of people who are now sustaining improvements in the core of the engineering cycle that makes it easier over time to engineer biology. So what do we want and could we get a strategy? I started out as a civil engineer, so I love big design objects. And the intersection, the best one I can find of civil engineering and bioengineering today is shown here. It's a double-decker suspension bridge grown in place from the roots of a rubber plant uh, in India. Uh, this is a very interesting object. It fixes carbon uh, in its manufacturing process. It gets stronger over time. It's passed down from one generation to the next. I used to think this takes too long to make, but it takes us a long time in the San Francisco area to make bridges. <laughs> so what do I wish for? I'll just be as straightforward as I can. We've got this natural nanotechnology. It's powered by photosynthesis. There's 90 terawatts of photosynthesis on Earth. Um, it's reproducing, growing, and healing materials. It's massively functional in terms of rearranging atoms, and it freaks people out when we talk about engineering. Um, so, how about we do the following? Provide for everybody, stabilize and recover biodiversity, transition from living on Earth to living with Earth, take infectious diseases off the table, enable a culture not of being consumers of biotech, but citizens of biotech, and yes, we'll understand how things work by tapering and building. Right? We are far from having... So this is what I wish for. I encourage you to figure out what you wish for, for biology because we're on it and whatever comes out will basically be what people stand up for. Um, could we develop a strategy? So, uh, you know when I briefed the federal agency to go for it back in 2003, we were operating in a security regime. The DNA synthesizers would not enable uh, a better future. They would enable garagistas to make hemorrhagic fevers and kill us all. So the net impact of my interaction with the government was to cut funding such that it existed for any of these tool developments. Uh, we instead then took it to the people, and in particular the students, which are the genuine renewable resource at university. Uh, and, and we said, would you be willing to work with us to help figure this out? Now remember all these people, but this one, this lady in particular. So these are our first 16 students. Uh, some years go by, and as mentioned, this is now the Genetic Engineering Olympics. Go to iGEM.org, the International Genetic Engineering Machines Competition. There's a couple weeks ago, in the Heinz Convention Center in Boston. It's no longer on a university campus because the class is, it's not an online course, it's a physical course. It's as big as a university operating on an annual basis. Um, what are these folks doing? So this is an old project where you have some teenagers who come into a laboratory and immediately in a microbiology lab, you're gonna realize that E. coli smells like crap. 
And so they decide that they would like to make a project where they clean up the odor of E. coli. They called their project O. de coli. <laughs> and so you're going to try and do biosynthesis of methyl salicylate, which is an odoring, uh, um, what you might find with wintergreen, and isolamyl acetate, which has a banana odor. Right? And, and they put some logic around this such that if the cells were growing, smell like wintergreen, and when they stop growing in the stationary phase, smell like bananas. That's what these iGEM students do, right, with the early tools they have. Uh, another project would be uh, from Cambridge, England. Um, e. coli has a dull brown color, uh, you know, but how about we just make a Crayola box of E. coli that can do biosynthesis of pigments, seven different pigments, red, purple, and so on. Um, so this is a, another example of what these students can do when given some of the tools of reusable parts and DNA synthesis and so on. For me as a PhD student, I'd have no chance of pulling this off. But now you see projects that require tens of thousands of dollars in capital and about 16 weeks of labor from a half dozen uh, first or second year undergraduates. Here's a question for you. What would you do with living pigments? They didn't know. But what was super cool was they connected with the designers at the Royal College of Art, the design students, to ask them. And the designers, who are professional at imagining what people might wish for, whether we know it or not, came up with some different ideas. We're going to have a probiotic yogurt that you drink. It goes into your gut. It's instrumented with sensors that detect the disease state of your alimentary canal. And if you're out of balance, like you have colitis showing up, or your immune system doing something weird, the, the color will be produced and come out of you in your scan that indicates the specialist you should go see or the treatment you should initiate. Right? Now what was interesting is the designers, they called that the scatalog. Right? And they mocked it up. Um, they also put this number next to it, 2049. That is not the price of the scatalog. That is the year that the designers in London thought we people would be culturally ready for this. Right. Um, the technology can be ready much sooner, right? And, and I find this to be particularly compelling in that when you think about medicine, we're limited in our ability to get information into and out from people. And our tools are typically chemical or hardware and sometimes now software based. But we should also consider the biology as a conduit for getting information in and out and acting on patients. And the cost of this type of diagnostic platform is essentially the cost of reproducing the microbe once you have it. So the cost basis on a unit uh, is much similar to the software than, say, an MRI machine. Okay, now the reality of 2012, not 2049, is really quite different. Uh, we have a, a domestic product that includes genetically engineered technologies. It's about 2.5% of our domestic economy, uh, of order 350 gigabucks a year. It's coarse-grained into three sectors. It's grown over time since the birth of genetic engineering, about 10 to 15% year-on-year growth of revenue. Um, this is a massive contribution to the economy. It's of order mining, extracting stuff from the crust of the earth. Uh, biologics are medicines, which you're familiar with. Industrial stuff would be enzymes, like in your laundry detergent, to help degrade food stains on your clothing, and then with plenty of controversy, GM food. Okay. So this is what our students graduate into, the so-called domestic and global bioeconomy, bigger still. Um, they also uh, graduate into uh, descriptions of wishes and ambitions, all right? And that's, that's really what I want to leave you with. Please start wishing about the biological future you want. Uh, here's a 10-year-old wish. Think about all the things we need in our society, and let's just unpack this one. How do we make all the crap we use? Stuff on the seats, and this, whatever. Right? And, and typically right now, a lot of it goes from fossil feedstocks through a whole bunch of chemical conversions at massive scale to make the materials we consume. And a proposal from the Department of Energy is to basically refactor, redesign, re-implement all of civilization's material supply chain to go from real-time biology, not fossil biology, right? and make the same stuff, right? but make it through a different supply chain. Remember that lady I asked you to remember from the course in 2003, she's now graduated, and she is the president of a company in Boston that employs about twice as many people uh, called Ginkgo Bioworks. They are the organism company. Their business offering is somebody comes to them and says, I wish I had an organism that makes whatever you want. And their output is the organism that makes that. 
and they get paid to make the organism, and they get royalties on the processing of that organism when it goes to market. And that's how they have business. Right? So, so, you know, the world that our students that we ship go into may or may not be perfectly aligned with everything we wish for. Uh, here's an example of what that could look like. This is from Amaris in Emeryville, California. These are yeast cells, and they're making, I believe, farnesine, uh, oily uh, molecule. Right? So, a lot of people call this the industrialization of biology. DuPont, a company now over 200 years old, is working through how to adapt their business strategy. They'd like to be 300 years old someday, still making money. They have six products on the market today that make money by building with biology. They imagine that their entire product catalog of materials becomes bio-based manufacturing. And uh, they're trying to figure out what's the plan. And one of the things that comes out of those discussions is effectively most of biotechnology has not yet been imagined, let alone made true. When you try to bring biology to market at scale, whether it's for food, in agriculture, or manufacturing, you have knock-on effects, right? So this is the sailing pavilion for the Beijing Olympics, where agricultural runoff carrying nutrients results in blossoming of natural organisms, overwhelming uh, what would normally be a nice place to go sailing or swimming. Uh, similarly, if you zoom out and come back in and you go, where are we going to grow all this stuff? We're going to have sustainable bio-based In fact, we're going to have to grow it somewhere. And uh, from the World Wildlife Fund, a representation of how we use our land on Earth, 24% uh, of the land on Earth that's capable of growing plants is now not under significant human direction, right? meaning it's pretty much wild. So, so when we bring forward the industrialization of biology, do we shift and lose more of that reservoir of wild plant-growing land, or do we go in the other direction? What do you want? By the way, as a bioengineer, these molecular gizmos I'm using to do stuff inside cells, I cannot, and nobody I know can really design those from scratch. We're harvesting or borrowing from natural biodiversity those objects and then repurposing them to do new stuff. So if I am not, as a bioengineer, a frontline defender of natural biodiversity, I'm a disinterested idiot, <laughs> just to give you a sense of how urgent that is. Um, more strange things, right? So remember, this part of the talk is, what's our strategy for getting into the future? that we might want. In the bioengineering buildings, the engineering quad on campus, I can buy food, it's awesome. Uh, being able to eat is really great, and you know, I love this stuff. You know, these expensive you know, fruit smoothies. Uh, they come with labels, so let's examine the labels. Uh, this is the ingredient list, um, easy to read. This is the ingredient list as prescribed by my government. And this is the ingredient list as prescribed by politics. <laughs> cultural politics. So I, I don't have much of a problem with this one. Why would I want to eat a modified organism? That sounds horrible. I'd like to eat an engineered organism. <laughs> right. um, so I can, I, can, I can talk myself around that one, no problem. But this smaller text, I, gotta, I, gotta, I just can't escape. Because they say, if a bio, oh geez, if a bioengineered version of ingredients is we're not going to use it. And I, I'm in a building with chemical engineering on the outside and bioengineering on the outside. So, you know, the bioengineers are eating stuff that's opposing bioengineering. That's strange, culturally strange. Now, lots of good reasons for that, but also it's a strange situation to be in. So could we develop a strategy? Daisy Ginsburg and I and others uh, wrote a book uh, about a year ago called Synthetic Aesthetics, and Daisy had this amazing observation, which is essentially, to paraphrase the quote, are we really going to make the engineering of living matter super great from a technical perspective and nothing's going to change? Do we really have to promise that the world won't change as a result of realizing a massive upgrade in engineering capacity? That just seems crazy. Um, and the Synthetic Aesthetics Project, which I'll give you an example of in a second, sort of started to wrestle with that question. Now to set this up, I want to show you this very important video of rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> when I had to first justify to my mom and friends and people who might not be engineers, you know, why I was pulled into bioengineering from civil engineering where I started, um, I, I represented that I am, for example, a member of the clan of opposable thumbs, that part of being human is to make, to create, to design. And I'm simply carrying on that tradition
with a new type of material, living matter, as my justification for why what I was doing was a, a normal thing to be doing. Um, and um, that's fine. Uh, you know, the utility associated with making, right? Uh, I'm suspicious, though, uh, that, and I was taught this lesson from my old professors uh, back east when I went to visit 20 years after graduating, that there's another way of thinking about how to engage with stuff. And, and it's not, um, you know, men and women the maker, but, but, but people as players, people who play. And this idea that before you have a culture of utility, you need to create a culture of play. And the rabbits here are illustrating uh, sort of a, an implicit question. Who taught them how to do what they're doing? You know, they don't, there's not it's a big, you know, university of rabbits where you go learn how to do this, I think. Um, so maybe we learn how to, maybe we just, you know, even though we're a generation into biotech in its current form, maybe we need to revisit what it means to play with biotechnology. So for so, so synthetic aesthetics, pick this up. So here's a, a quick vignette from one of the six projects that we commissioned. Uh, the form of this work was to uh, have an open call for artists and synthetic biologists to want to spend time with each other. And we paid for an artist to spend one month in the lab, and then the laboratory researcher to go spend one month in the studio as a symmetric residency. And Sissel Talas and Christina Agapakis all share their work. So this is Sissel, a perfumer from Berlin, working with Christina, then a microbiologist at Harvard. And, and Sissel at the time was super interested in the odor or perfume of cheese. So as people know, cheese has different odors. Um, they went to the cheese shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts and pulled core samples of the stinkiest cheeses and brought them back to the lab and played it out on dishes to grow the microbes to do sort of a determinative microbiology. Um, and, and, and that was a nice thing to do. But it triggered conversations because at the time in microbiology, and still today, one of the most amazing things happening is we're coming to understand what's called the human microbiome, the microbes that live on us, on our skin, and in us. And um, they're all over the place. You know, we are microbes as much as mammals. Um, and they got to talking, Christina and Cecil did, and some of these cheeses they brought back were small batch artisanal cheeses, wherein the materials are worked with manually by humans who have skin that has microbes on it. And so it raised the question, what is the relationship between the human microbiome and the cheese microbes? Now, in science, normally, what you would do is an analytical study where you'd sequence everything today and then use a computer to find the patterns in the DNA sequence data. But this is a synthetic exploration. So they took a different approach, which was to go around the Harvard campus and collect microbial samples from the skin of their colleagues, a philosopher's toe. <laughs> And then you go to the farm, you get raw goat milk, and you inoculate that, and you have 48 different bottles of that, and you put that in the thing, and you make cheese. <laughs> I happened to be traveling through Boston when they brought out a platter of 48 cheeses, and we hadn't worked through the biosafety uh, aspects of this, so we didn't eat it, we just took it. And I can report that the cheese made from the microbes found in Daisy's armpit is divine. <laughs> That's a citrus floral bouquet. It's really quite stunning. Um, the cheese made from the microbes found on the toe of the philosopher, you would have to invent a new adjective for me to describe how foul it was the worst odor I've ever encountered. Now, at, a, at an abstract level, uh, this project really threw me for a loop. I wasn't expecting any of this. They did all of this in about two weeks from getting together, right? My mom, growing up, you know, said things like, treat your body as a temple, you are what you eat, and so on and so forth, finish your greens, and so on and so forth. And, and this project reversed that. It, it said, we eat what we are. And, and somehow in modernity, we, 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 for good public health reasons, establish these barriers between what it means to be a, a modern human in the peninsula right, area and biology. But this project is, is teaching me to reconnect right, and to re-engage. Okay, so to, to begin to wrap up, um, pretty fast actually, I want to I wanna just leave you with some wonderings. Um, so let's live in the future for a little bit. Let's presume that the nerd rapture has occurred. Every bit of science anybody wants to know about life has been worked out. Every technology any bioengineer ever could imagine wanting exists. Then what? 
and we've made living matter completely engineerable. What's happening? How are things different? What are the transactions? Do, does money still matter? And if so, how's it made? What are the platforms? What's needed that nobody's doing? And most importantly, is there anything unique about this future that biology can help us get to? Superpowers that living matter has that might help us get the world we want. So, remember the keynote some years ago, just a few years ago actually, we've got three new devices, a music player, a web browser, and a phone. It turns out to be one object. So I want you to imagine Apple or Google or maybe even Facebook um, announcing a new product. It's the personal DNA synthesizer. Call it the stink gen. Okay? <laughs> and it's great. It does three things. It will let you make your medicines right where you are, whether you're on Mars or in Menlo Park. It will let you store your memories into DNA. Why would you give your uh, love of your life some really dull, boring block of carbon when you can encode your love poems and photographs into a piece of DNA that's compressed into jewelry? It's not much more meaningful. And your kids, man, everybody's going to want to learn by doing stuff. And, you know, you've got Minecraft on the computers, but we're going to have Microcraft, you know, mushroom building blocks. You know, the stick jet's going to power all of this. You're going to want it. People, in other words, might be able to make a lot more locally if you gave them DNA printers to let you go from information to the physical DNA material. And the organisms you'd run this DNA in are things that eat sugar, methane, light, <coughs> crop, debris, and so on. Let me just give you a test, right, to see if you can start to integrate this. Not to give you a, the right answer, but just to think about the future you want. So this is an artifact. This photo is an artifact of our current society. Brad gets a lot of money to market the stuff in this bottle that's made in a centralized facility and then resold through duty-free catalogs on our planes and the stuff has to be physically trucked around and people slather the stuff all over them so they have a particular odor. All right. So now you have the Stinkjet DNA printer. You have an online store called iFumes. You download for 99 cents the DNA sequence encoding the biosynthetic pathway of the particular odorants you want. Remember that iGen project that made the odor holy? You then slather that DNA, the code, if you will, on your epidermal ecosystem, the microbes that live on you, and perfume is now programmed. Right? You have living programmable scent generation. No cost of transportation. No centralized manufacture. Other issues to work through. Brad, you still got to pay Brad, right? Because somebody's got to market the heck out of this. Um, so, for example, right? Imagine that Del Monte Foods has a free download called Banana Free Banana Bread. You put this DNA program in your yeast and you make banana bread, but no bananas needed. You get the odors of bananas. Um, PG&E is, is selling an engineered methanotroph that actually you can divert the natural gas in your house not to burn and make heat, but to actually make food. You know, a third of your natural gas supply should be enough atoms of energy to make a food for a family for every day. It'll taste like not so great right away. Um, you know, Hawaiian Tropic has an algae uh, that makes sunscreen. Um, Samsung has an engineered mushroom that makes a cell phone. That's a free download if you subscribe to the data plan. Um, you know, Google Life Sciences has the Google Diagnostic, the diagnostic yogurt. They figured out how to bring that to market. Uh, 99 bucks to American Cancer Society gets you a download program for an engineered T cell to erase various uh, pre tumors, and so on. Just to, just to stretch you and think to, uh, you know, the nerve rapture has occurred, what's happening in the world? Okay, so zooming out, um, how do we realize a society of citizens? I happen to be in the middle of a place that seems to result in the shifting of technologies that turns people into consumers. And when I think about my boy who's two and a half growing up, I don't want him to live in a society of consumers. I want him to live in a society of citizens. I don't exactly know what that means, but I know I prefer it. Um, and, and then I think this is real uh, 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 current and pressing. We, we've been living on Earth, and we need to get to living with Earth. When the engineering school at Stanford was started, it was 90 years ago, 91 years ago, there were wild grizzly bears in California. There's 2 billion people on Earth then, there's 7 going on 8 billion people today. The number of animals, apparently, that are in the populations in the wild on Earth has dropped by half since I've been born. Um, that just isn't good, and you know we got to upgrade that massively. Okay, so to end, is now the right time to think about design biology? Yes, because there's sustained improvements in the tools. Don't
don't take that for granted, but it's happening. What might we wish for? I gave you one quick synopsis. Come up with your own, please. And let me leave you with this. Do you have a plan? Do you have a strategy for realizing this biotech future? It really is up to us. Thanks very much.